scripture, I mean through uh, scripture and through uh, movies and things like that. And let me just go ahead and tell you this. I just need to make this uh, precursor right up front. You cannot, you cannot check out in this message today. I'm just letting you know, because if you do, then you're going to hear something that doesn't complete itself until the end of the message. And you're going to have a precursor and a preconceived idea that is not full and you may get mad. You with me? And so I need you to look at your spouse or your neighbor or somebody and say, I'm here till the end. Come on, I'm here till the end. Look at your other neighbor and say, you're here till the end. Okay. <laughs> I'm here till the end, Miss Cynthia. She's by herself over there. We need to fix that next week. Somebody go sit with her. Um, yeah, he's on the way. He plays the drums. No, I, so I'm excited about week three of, uh, there you go. I'm excited about week three of At the Movies, and here's why. This is a message that I heard a friend of mine in some, sh- some way, shape, or form give, and it impacted me personally very deeply. It changed my life. In fact, I sent Pastor Travis to his church to go uh, shadow and learn some things. We believe in learning from people that are doing it bigger and better than we are. And uh, if you don't believe in that, you need to because it will change your life. I sent him up to, the church, to the, their church to meet with them and to learn from them for a weekend. And he heard this message, uh, a, a variation of this message live. And uh, he came back. He said, Pastor, you have got to go see that. You've got to go on their website and watch it. I went and watched it. And I'm just telling you, you've got to stick with it. But it impacts you so deeply, it's insane. And so I want you, if you're taking notes, to write this down. Laugh for a minute. Get the laugh out. And then I want you to stick with me, okay? And this is what we're talking about. What would Jesus say to Christian Gray? Go ahead, laugh. Because you're like, and here's what I know. Some of you are like, why would he talk about that in church? Well, I just don't understand why it's okay to talk about everything else in our circles of friends, but we can't talk about it in the presence of God. We, we can talk about people and about things in the, in the circle in our li- private living room, but when it comes to the presence of God in the house of God, we can't talk about that stuff. You know what I'm saying? We can't talk about money. And we can't talk about relationship. Don't talk about that stuff. We, there's certain things we don't talk about in the presence of God, and I'm just telling you there ain't nothing that we shouldn't talk about in the presence of God. So you got to stick with me, okay? You with me? Say, I'm here. Here we go. So... This is based off of a series of, of books and movies. And let me just tell you, some of you are like, oh, man, he's about to call me out. I honestly don't care if you've seen the movie or read the books. That is not what I'm here for. I'm not even going to talk about the movie or the books. I'm here to talk about the character that everybody is infatuated with. I'm here to talk about and learn from the, ba- from the history and the background of a character because that's what the movies and the books are all about. Let me tell you how popular this stuff is. And why are we talking about this? Because this is a popular movie. It's popular movie and popular books. Let me, let me explain it to you about the books. It's based off a series of books written by uh, Erica Mitchell, who is also known as E.L. James, right? And so she goes in, she writes these books called Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Grey. And, uh, and so what happens is, is in this time, let me tell you how popular these things got. In, these, uh, in 2005, there was a book that came out. How many readers do we have in the house? Any readers? Any readers? Not asking about reading that book, just readers. Some of you are like, I don't know. This is a trick question. It's not a trick question, I promise. In 2005, a book came out called The Girl with the uh, Dragon Tattoo, right? Some of you read that. Some of you have not. Anybody read that? Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, right? It sold, in 2005, 30 million copies. 30 million copies. I, would, I want to write a book. I've written one book. I'm about to write another one. I want to keep writing books. And I want them to sell 30 million copies. You know what I'm saying? I'll even pray that you'll write a book that will sell 30 million copies if you'll tithe on it. I ain't, I ain't going to pray for you to have unblessed money, ungodly money. I'll pray for you to have godly money, but not ungodly money. 30 million copies, that's insane. And then, then in 2007, there was a book with a religious theme behind it called The Shack. Anybody ever seen The Shack, read The Shack? It was a movie, The Shack, right? In 2007, The Shack came out. The Shack sold 22 million copies. $22 million. And somebody said, that was a good one. I need to go read it. My father-in-law has been telling me for like, I don't know, 34 years to read it. I'm 34 years old. Um, 22 million copies. That's a lot of, that's a lot of books. And then, and then in 2015, more recently, there was a book that came out that was called The uh, Girl on the Train. Girl on the Train. Anybody read Girl on the Train? I don't know anything about it, so I ain't judging you when you raise your hand. I, know. I just know it was really one of the most popular books of, of that time. 
And uh, that book sold 15 million copies. Now, you've got to remember, there's hard copies and now there's digital copies. And so all of that factors into declining numbers. But 15 million copies, good grief, that's a lot of books that go out. You know what I'm saying? Like, y'all need to pray the double portion anointing on me <laughs> for the next book. You know what I'm saying? And uh, 15 million copies is insane. But this book, Fifty Shades of Grey, this series is the third most popular book in the 21st century. Why are you talking about that? It's the third most popular book in the 21st century. Right? There's people that come into church every single week that's going to know exactly what I'm talking about here in just a minute. It, this book sold over 100 million copies. Over 100 million copies. I want to sell over 200 million copies. <laughs> Double a portion, praise God. But this book is based on a man that um, has a lifestyle. We'll go. I see some kids that weren't turned into radiate kids today. So I'll be diplomatic with you. It's based on the character of a man. And every fictional character has a real background to him. There is not a writer, there is not a producer that creates a fictional movie or a fictional character that does not build a personality and a background to the person and live it out in the story. Happens all the time. And so there's a story and a background of this man. This thing is based on a man that lives a lifestyle that, um, that is controversial, but is enam it, people are just enamored with it. And I want to give you a little bit of his background, and I'm going to do it kind of quickly so that you know where I'm going with it. Are you going to stick with me today? you got to stick with me, okay? I want to tell you, so he was a young boy. Um, <laughs> he starts as a young lad, and... He starts as a young boy, and uh, he, as he's growing up, his mother, his biological mother, is a, a drug addict and um, uh, a prostitute. Let's just be honest. She's a prostitute and a drug addict, right? And so uh, she with, is with her handler. We'll call him that, her handler. And uh, Christian Gray and his biological mother are growing together and uh, living together. And Christian sees this man repeatedly abuse his mother, like within inches of her life. And after a few years, his mother decided that she could not take the abuse anymore, could not live in life anymore, so she overdoses on drugs and takes her own life. Well, in that moment, um, Christian is the only other person in the room with her. And it takes authorities four days to find her deceased. So he is in the room with her for four days, his deceased mother, just him and her trying to figure out how to live in life. So the authorities, come on now, the authorities show up four days later. They take him to the hospital to get him some help. And as he's in the room getting some help, the doctor, Dr. Gray, falls in love with Christian. And so she decides, her and her husband decide, that they're going to adopt Christian. So they adopt Christian, and obviously the guy's got some, some problems, some issues going on in life, right, some nightmares, things like that that are happening. And so they do their best to raise him, and then at 15 years old, Christian... Uh, begins to go and get a job. Most people around 15 decide they want a job, they want a car, they want money, they want all that stuff, so go get a job, right? He goes and gets a job as the gardener for one of her friends, his stepmother or his uh, adopted mother's friends. And in the moment, uh, she begins to think that Christian is attractive. I don't have to tell you that that's a major problem. So she's married, she finds him attractive, and they begin this relationship that is unhealthy. I think you can read between the lines there. And as they're beginning this relationship that's unhealthy, she begins to introduce him to a lifestyle that he begins to then live out in the book. So what you see in the book and in the movie is a lifestyle that a woman, when he was 15 years old, began to introduce him to. Well, not only did she introduce him to that lifestyle, but she introduced him to many other women throughout those six years that she was doing this relationship with him. She introduced him to many other women, which convoluted the man's thought process and created some psychological warfare that happened there and about six years in her husband the woman's husband found out that she was having this relationship and give the man Christian over one hundred thousand dollars within that time and he abused her within an inch of her life and Christian got to see that well then about that time sometime after that is when you see Christian meet a woman named Anastasia and Anastasia and him have this relationship that is now lived out all across the silver screen with very little uh, imagination needed to figure out what was happening, right? Now, again, I'm not here to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. I believe the uh, concept of mature Christianity is being, being able to make your own decisions based on what God tells you. 
I shouldn't have to sit here and tell you what to do and what not to do. This is your life, and you're, I'm not going to get into that. But what I am going to get into is this. I believe that there's a lot of us sitting in the room today that the reason I want to talk about this is because there's a little bit of Christian gray in every single one of us. And I want you to stick with me to hear this because there's three things I believe Jesus would say to Christian gray. Three things I believe Jesus would say to Christian gray. The first one is this. It hurts me that someone hurt you. I believe wholeheartedly that Jesus would, would look at Christian, this character, he would look at, G, at Christian and go, what you've been through in your life, what hurt you, it hurts me. That someone has deeply, intimately, and painfully hurt you. It bothers me. Because here's what I know about Jesus. The more I get to know Jesus in a relationship manner, the more I get to know Jesus in a biblical manner, the more I get to know Jesus in a kingdom manner, he hurts when we hurt. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when he's talking about the body of Christ, he says this. He says, what I need you to do as the body of Christ is to celebrate with one another and mourn with one another. Why? Because we are to be more like Jesus, which means we, he celebrates with us and he mourns with us. He hurts when we hurt. He hurts with us. He hurts for us. He feels your pain. He knows your pain. And some of you are already sitting out there today going, I can relate with what Christian's been through. Because some of you feel like you're already in that abusive situation or things like that. I just need to tell you today, we will help you. We have some big guys on our security team. No, I'm, I'm kidding about that. But we will help you. We will find ways to help you. If you're in that situation and you let somebody know today, one of our volunteers know today, I promise you we'll find a way to get you help. But the truth of the matter is that he hurts with us. And, and I need to be reminded of that sometimes because I know it's believed that pastors float above the ground with halos and they shine everywhere they go. They glow in the dark, right? But I need to be reminded sometimes that when I hurt, he hurts. You need to be reminded sometimes that when you hurt, he hurts. It, hurt is not the problem. Our reaction to the hurt is how we treat the hurt. We can hang out in the hurt, and we can stand in the hurt, and we can pop a tent up in the hurt, and we can, we can, we can, we can just live right there in the hurt and let everything we do in our lives just come out of the hurt. And we can just sit there miserable and, and just rotten and terrible and hate everybody that comes into our life because of the hurt. Or we can decide we're going to move on and get past it because he, he hurts with us. I want to I read... Something to you real quick today. He hurts with us and he hurts for us. Isaiah, you can write these down. They're going to come up on the screen. I'm, I'm bouncing a little bit today. But Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 says this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. So what he's saying, what Isaiah is saying here is this. As the prophet, this is what God wants to happen through his people. He's going to anoint and he's going to bless and he's going to grace you to do this. And then 1B says this. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim, proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. In other words, Isaiah is saying this. God so desperately wants freedom for every single person on the face of the earth that he has anointed me and blessed me and he's blessed each and every one of us as the body of Christ to go out and to set freedom through God into people's lives. I just need you to know today, God does not intend for you to stay bound in your hurt. God does not intend for you to stay bound in your negativity. God does not intend for you to stay bound in your previous actions. God intends for liberty and for freedom for the captives to break every chain off of your life and do something powerful in your life because that's what he desires. Desires. But what can happen when we get hurt is we begin to live in the hurt because that's all we know. And I can't get out of the hurt. And I'm just here to tell you, you can't get out of the hurt by yourself. It's only through the anointing and the power of God in your life that can get you out of the hurt. I believe Jesus would not only look at Christian Gray, but to look at us and say, I'm here to hurt with you. I hurt because you hurt. I, I, I am hurt that someone hurt you. It hurts me. It bothers me. It pains me. In fact, one of my favorite scriptures right now is Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that says that God works all things to together for the good of those who love him um, and according to the good of those who love him. Here's the, listen to me. Here's the deal. He says, I will work all things together for the good, right? He never says everything will be good. 
in fact, for him to work all things together for the good, then something bad has to take place for him to take bad and make good out of it. And see, we get caught up in this hurtful lie that everything we go through in life is supposed to be peachy clean and good, especially after we give our lives to Jesus. We give our lives to Jesus, everything's going to be okay, my finances are going to be taken care of, I'm going to feel good all the time, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be like the annoying people that are on morning radio all the time that just seem like they never have nothing but a smile on them. Hey, how are you? Good morning. I turn those people off. I'm like, get off my radio. You drive me crazy. It's 5 a.m., I'm going to the gym. I'm not happy. You shouldn't be happy. You know what I'm saying? And we, th- we fall into this trap that everything's taken care of, but God never said everything would be taken care of or everything would be great. Here's what he said. He said, it's not that it will be great. It's that I'll make it great. I can take anything painful. I can take anything hurtful. I can take anything wrong in your life that you don't even agree with, and instead of you camping out in the hurt, I'll turn it around and I'll blend it together into this good drink that you can drink called the life of Jesus Christ that I've given you. It's called life and life more abundantly. He didn't say, I'll, I'll, I'll make it good, or, or, or make everything good. He said, I'll make everything work together for good. And then, and then in, in John chapter 16, verse 33, if you'll write that one down for me real quick. John 16, 33 says this. I love, I love the way that this is worded. He says, these things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. Remember, you're not going to have peace outside of him. He says, in me you'll have peace. In other words, outside of me there is no peace. And outside of me, Jesus is talking, outside of me there is, there is false peace, there is faux peace, there is peace that you think um, control and, 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 and money and all these things can bring. But the truth is, none of that brings peace. It's only inside of the relationship with Jesus Christ that you truly find peace. He said, in me you will find peace. And then he says this, in the world you have tribulation. Everybody say tribulation. Don't think tribulation as in, um, you know, just... Things, the end of the world. I want you to think tribulation as in hard times, because that's what he's talking about here. In the world, you will have hard times. You will have difficulty. You will have pain. You will have suffering. It's just going to happen. We talked about that in the You Asked For It series, if you want to go back and watch that. It, it's just going to happen in life, that pain and difficulty and trials and tribulation is going to take place. But he says this, in the world, you will have tribulation, but take courage. In other words, stand up with boldness, for I have overcome the world. So what God Jesus is telling me in the moment is this. You're going to have the hard times, the bad times, the difficult times. You're going to have the hurts and the pains and the frustrations, the confusions and the misunderstandings. You're going to have all that stuff. You're not going to agree with everybody all the time. That's just the way it is. But when those moments come, you need to take courage because when you take courage, you understand, I have overcome the world. In other words, there's nothing you'll go through that I haven't already conquered. There's no pain that will take, that'll take the place of victory I put in your life. There's no hurt. There's no pain. There's no frustration. There's no misunderstanding I Jesus have overcome the world there's nothing you'll face that I have not overcome there's nothing you'll face that I have not given you victory for for I have overcome the world because peace is found in me I believe Jesus would say to us I know Jesus would say to us in the Christian gray that it hurts me that someone hurt you and then I think he would say this too I I think he'd say this too that uh, we need to stop looking for people to fill what only he can we need to stop looking for people to fill what only he can. See, if you know his story and his background, and if you know, and full disclosure, I haven't seen the movies, but I've done research on the background of the character. And the truth is, is if you see uh, the background of the character, you begin to see he never had power or control in his life. And when he began to get some of it, he thought that's what he needed to conquer life. That's what he needed right there. I need, if I have, because what the, what the world will tell us is the more money and the more control and the more title we have, the more influence we can make. Listen, title is nothing without authority and influence. You can have a t- title all day long, but it doesn't mean you have influence. It just means you have a title. And see, the truth is, 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 is we get caught up in this thing that where we are in these relationships, and most of the time the reason relationships break down is not because it's two terrible people trying to make a relationship happen, friendship, uh, romantic relationship, anything like that. It's because there's a responsibility or an expectation placed on somebody that was, they were never intended to carry. That's what happens all the time is, is that's why whenever we begin to pour out our hearts and we just say, I'd just like to be transparent, and, I, and we pour our hearts out to people that never were intended to carry the weight that we're putting on them, and then they turn around, they don't know what to do with the weight, so they start sharing it, and then all our news gets everywhere, and we get stabbed in the back, and we get mad at the person, and we never have a friendship anymore with that person, because why? It's probably because you put an expectation on them God never intended them to carry to begin with. 
And let me just go ahead and tell you this. Can I just define this? Gossip is defined as this. I love this definition. A friend of mine told me this last week, and I have not left it. Gossip is this, telling somebody the problem that can't fix it. Because all you're doing is spreading information at that point. You know, we got to stop. And here's what we do a lot of times is we want the double portion anointing, but we don't want to stay with God through the process. And so we'll sit there and we'll put an expectation on God to come through for our needs, for our moments, that he's a gumball machine, that if we put a quarter in or a prayer in and we turn the knob, then we get an answer out. And the truth is, that ain't not, that's not a relationship, that's a transaction. And we put an expectation on God that he is to come through in a transaction when God is going, that's not the grace, that's not what I was intended to carry. I was not intended to carry a transaction. I was intended to carry your burdens. I was intended to carry your pains. I was intended to carry your frustrations. I was intended to carry your life through purpose, and I was intended to carry you through relationship. And that's when we get mad at God because God didn't come through like we thought he should come through. We didn't, it didn't happen like we thought it should happen. It didn't happen that way. I need the control, God. Well, I'll give you my life, but I can't. I'll give you my, 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 my salvation, but I can't give you my life. I'll give you my job, but I can't give you my paycheck. I'll give you my time at church, but I can't give you my family at home. You with me? Come on. I want to, I want to read to you a couple of scriptures out of the Message Bible. And, and here, before we get into that, hang on before you throw that up. Before we get into that, I just want to say this. This is one of the most commonly misused phrases. And, 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 and when, it, when, when I heard it, I bucked it for a minute, and then I was like, you know what, it actually makes sense, is this. We look at our spouses, our friends, or whatever, and here's a common phrase, you complete me. You complete me, baby. You know why we say that? Because it makes the other person feel good. Megan loves it whenever I say, you complete me. She's like, I do, don't I? (laughs) Can I tell you, you were never meant to be completed by a person. You are meant to be completed by a Savior. You weren't meant to be completed by somebody because when their completion is, is when they complete you, then the moment that they fail you, because it's going to happen, I don't care who it is, they're going to fail you, they're going to hurt you, they're going to let you down. The moment that they fail you, your completion now falls down the drain and you're broken and you're put down and you're frustrated and it's because you put an expectation of completion on them that they were never meant to co- carry. They're not meant to complete you, they're meant to compliment you. They're meant to support and push you up. And we do it all the time. I do it all the time. And you complete me, baby. I just want to look at her and go, you compliment me, baby. And I'm not talking about, like, I look good. I'm talking about, like, I just need help. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Yesterday, the baby was crying. And I was like, I have tried everything. I don't know what to do. And as soon as I handed him to to Megan, it was over. I was like, you compliment me. (laughs) Praise God. Travis is learning that at 3 a.m. right now. Matthew 16, 24 through 26 in the Message Bible. I'm going to read it off the screen if that's okay with you. It says this. I want to stop at the very beginning. It says, then Jesus went to work on his disciples. And when Jesus goes to work on you, it's going to be rough, but it's going to be good. It says, Jesus went to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You are not in the driver's seat. I am. Whoa. He looked at his disciples. He said, He said, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. In other words, hey, guys, before you get in this boat with me, you need to understand something. I'm I'm not getting in your boat. You're getting in mine. You got to let me lead. You got to let me tell where to go because you're not in the driver's seat, bud. I am. This ain't your boat that I'm riding in. You're riding in mine. And often what we do is we invite God on the journey of our lives instead of allowing us to be on the journey of his. We, we want God's provision, we want God's blessing, we want God's purpose, but we want to be in control of it all, and you can't do that. It's not our life to be in control of. It's not our life to earn more control. It's His life to go, you're not my co-pilot, God. I'm your co-pilot. You tell me where to go, I'll go. You tell me what to do, I'll do. If you tell me to jump up and down and do 16 jumping jacks, Guess what I'm going to do? Jump up and down and do 16 jumping jacks. No matter if it makes sense or it doesn't make sense, God, i got to go where you want me to go. Can I tell you, can I be transparent with you for a minute? Are you with me? Give me just a few more minutes. The truth is, I have fought more spiritual warfare over this message than I have any other message probably in 2018. Well, Pastor, you probably shouldn't have done it. Nope. I knew I was supposed to do it. But everything on the inside tried to tell me not to do it. What, what are people going to think? What will they say? How will they respect, receive it? I'm not held responsible for how anybody receives the gospel. I'm held responsible for how I give it. 
And here's the thing. Listen, listen, listen. I'm just being honest with you for a minute. Here's the thing. If this scripture is true, if John 3.16 is true, because we know that one, right? Then Matthew 16.24 has to be true. Hey, you, Jesus just tells me sometimes, hey, Brandon, this ain't your boat, buddy. I'm not jumping in line with you. You better jump in line with me. We can't have control and submission to Jesus. And then he says this. He says, don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. In other words, you ain't going to help yourself. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way to finding yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? What could you ever trade for your soul? Wow. In other words, another scripture says it like this. Don't gain the whole world and lose your soul. Listen, church. I think Jesus would look at every single one of us and say this. Man, I love it. I think he'd look at us and just basically say, it's not your journey. It's mine. The thing that you think you have to control, if you'd let me control, it'd go a whole lot better. Quit gripping, white knuckling at 10 and 2, the steering wheel of this ride, and give it over and slide to the passenger seat and ride with me. Because the truth is, is you're looking to people to provide acceptance for what only I can give you acceptance for. Stop looking for everybody else's approval of what you're saying and what you're doing and what you're accomplishing in this life because you need to stop looking for people to provide what only I can. Only I can provide completeness. Only I can provide power. Only I can provide the direction of your purpose. Nobody else can. I will use people to do that, but you have to be fully submitted to me to hear it. You with me today? I think Jesus would not just say that to Christian Gray, but Jesus would say that to me, to you to our families, because here's what I know as I go into number three, that we're all a little bit of Christian gray. Because I think the third thing that Jesus would say to Christian gray is this, I came to you so you could come to me. The most important thing. Listen, listen. You know how I know we're all a part of Christian gray? Because we've all been hurt on a deep level. Because we all look to people at some point to provide what only God could. And because for every last one of us, he came so that we could come to him. John chapter 3, verses 17 through 18, I mentioned 316 earlier. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not have perished but have everlasting life. We know that one. We can rattle it off in our sleep. We can quote it even though we don't know any other scripture in the Bible. We know that one. That's a good one to know. I'm not doubting that. But what we fail to see is 17 and 18. And 17 and 18 says it like this. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Can I tell you something? We have this false dichotomy in, in perspective of Jesus that the whole reason He came to the earth was to judge us one day. That's not even true. It's not even biblical. In fact, he explains that in 18. He says this, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. Here's what Jesus says. I didn't come to judge you. Judging has already taken place. It's our decision what part of the judgment we walk in. Relationship or no relationship. I came to you. So you could come to me. Another scripture uh, uh, phrase or version, excuse me, says it like this. I came to seek and to save those that were lost. In other words, I am going to walk this earth with everything I have so that in those moments, I will find those that are not in relationship with me. And I will save their soul. I did not come to judge the world. In fact, my entire purpose for Jesus, the entire purpose was this. I came to you for one reason. Not to tell you your life has been terrible. Not to tell you what you've done in your life is bad. I came to you so that you had access to come to me. Can I tell you something really, really powerful? And I'm closing with this. 
It's not your actions that will get you to heaven. You can do good. You can pray at this altar. You can do all these things. The more I did, the more he loved. But it's not that. It's the more I posture, the closer I get. I came to you. Now you see why I said you got to stick with me to the end? Because a lot of us are Christian gray. We've been hurt. We look to people. And he came to us. And today the greatest thing that I can imagine is in just a few moments, and I'm going to ask you to stick around for this uh, because I'm about to close, is we're going to have baptism right outside. we got at least eight people that have given their lives to Jesus that are ready to get baptized today. And I want to tell you this as well, that there's some of you that may give your lives to Jesus here in about two minutes. And you may go, it's time, I can't wait anymore. It's time to get baptized. You know what I want you to do? Whenever we give that call, Pastor Travis will tell you what to do. You get up, you walk out. We got towels, clothes, deodorant, anything you need to get baptized. We got you covered today. You don't have to wait. Hey, I found out about a guy that gave his life to Jesus in the lobby right before this service today. Come on. And tell me that God ain't doing something. But I just want you to know, this wasn't about the movie today. This was about you. And this was about me. If you would, bow your heads with me this morning. And I just want to ask you to do something. If you're in here and you'll say, Pastor, I need to give my life to Jesus. Maybe you did it a long time ago. But you didn't posture your heart. You only postured your actions. Or maybe you say, Pastor, I've never prayed that prayer, but today I'm ready to do it. I need to be serious about this thing. we got people getting set and ready to, to welcome you and pray with you and get things ready. But I want to ask you to do something today. If you're in the room and you say, it's time for me to give my life to Jesus today. I can't wait anymore. Would you throw your hand up in the air right where you're at? Right where you're at. Throw your hand in the air. If you're ready to say, I will submit my life to Jesus. Amen. You're going to feel, you're going to feel a clipboard come in your hand. And that's just information. Hold it up high because we want to pray with you and we want to talk with you and we want to be with you. We want to walk with you through this. Hold it up high. Amen. And now, Here's what I want to do. They're, they're sliding that in your hands. Here's what I want to do. I want all of us as a family to say this. Dear Jesus, I love you. I submit everything I have to you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. This is my day for new life. This is my moment for new life. I give you my life. I give you my heart. And I ask that you forgive me. Walk with me, teach me, and connect me with people that will help me get closer to you. If you would, stand to your feet with me. Father, right now, stand to your feet. Father, we honor you. We praise you. God, I pray that if there's anybody in the room that gave their heart to Jesus today, that's ready to get baptized, that we take that next step. Let's fill out that card. Thank you for new life. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us salvation. And thank you for bringing us to new life today. Come on, church. Let's sing this together one more time. Come on.